Good morning and good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. This morning we're going to be uh, in uh, a passage of Luke 12 and a passage of math in Matthew 18 that nobody likes to talk about. Uh, this is going to be the blessed servants versus the hypocrites versus the other three servants. I think you're going to be blessed by this. I think you're going to find it very interesting. And uh, let's get let's get started. Let's start with Luke chapter 12 verses 41 through 48. Luke 12, 41 through 48. And it reads, Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? All right, faithful and wise steward. Who is that? Well, first of all, what's a steward? A steward is a servant. What's a servant? Well, there's two different types of servants. There's the servants that aren't slaves. They willingly entered into a labor agree agreement. Okay? A covenant. A labor agreement. Key word there is labor. Hello? In other words, you're going to be given your daily rations and maybe a little extra if you perform your duties, your mission, your daily instructions. All right? Faithful and wise steward. Now, the other opposite of that is the servant that's a slave. Shouldn't we be a slave to God? He doesn't, Father doesn't want you thinking of it like that, no. You should be someone who has entered into a labor agreement, and he will give you the, uh, the things that you need to accomplish your mission. All right? This is a blessed servant. A faithful and wise servant is a blessed servant. In other words, no matter when the master of that steward or servant came to check or you could think of it as a head foreman, whatever. When he comes to check on the on the workers, does he find them working? Now, if it's break time, that's different. But if it's not break time, are you working? Are you earning your pay? Are you doing what I told you to do? I catch you every time I look. I find you working, doing what you're supposed to do. You're a faithful and wise steward. And you are a member of the blessed. Now, blessed is that servant who we just talked about, who, when his master, will find so doing when he comes. When does Jesus come? When does he return? Jesus comes at the seventh bowl, the last day of this age, battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's when Jesus returns. That's his returning, the day of his revealing, that's the day you are joined to the Lord. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Does he come in phases? No. But the uh, but Father, his invisible presence, does rise at the sixth seal to shake the earth mightily. All right? And to send forth the whirlwinds of the Lord during the day of the Lord, which lasts for 945 days. See my other lessons? But Jesus doesn't return in the flesh, spiritual flesh, glorified flesh that you can see, that you can touch, that you can sit down and have a meal with. That's on the last day of the age, seventh bowl. I come as a thief, Revelation 16, 15. You've got to keep your wedding garments, endure to the end, hold fast, all the way, and wait patiently all the way up until the seventh bowl. 1,335 days following the abomination of desolation set up in the temple at the fifth seal by the Antichrist. If you haven't watched any of my lessons, I, I hope that sparked your interest. Uh, verse 43, Blessed is that servant, that faithful and wise servant, who entered into that labor agreement, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he 
will make him ruler over all that he has. Now this is a parable, but it's also the truth. But because it's a parable, the New King James Version, like probably every other version, is not um, capitalizing the H's in he, for example, or, or, or uh, my kingdom. Okay, because it's a parable, but you should know when Jesus is referring to Father or himself, it's, but don't look for the capitalizations during a parable. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler, Father will make him ruler over all that he has. Well, first of all, during the thousand years of the millennium and then throughout eternity. In your glorified new body, you will help rule. And you will also serve as priest, and man of dust bodies will also serve as priest. But you will be one of the glorified blessed, helping to Jesus to rule over them. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, in other words, we're talking about someone who has entered into the labor agreement. Uh, the passages in Matthew 13 should be coming to mind now, brothers and sisters. In Matthew 13, you find how many different servants? Four. Are you going to find four servants mentioned here? Yes. These are the same four examples, the same four servants you saw in Matthew 13. All right. The first one, the blessed, faithful, and wise steward or servant that entered into the labor agreement. In other words, they were saved. They asked Father for forgiveness and accepted Jesus Christ as their master. All right. The one that tells them uh, their mission. The, the head foreman, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They're the ones that fell on good ground. Now you've got one of the servants, somebody who entered into a labor agreement with Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his father, and uh, was great for a while. And then he started to doubt because the foreman never came to check on him. Foreman never came. Not never, but it just taken a while. For, the servant was like, the foreman's never come to check on us. I, I don't have to worry about getting caught. You know what? I'm tired of being goody two-shoes. It's time to have some fun. And, or maybe he even gets a little grumpy. But he starts to lay his hands and physical harm on who? on the fellow servants. Did you catch that, brothers and sisters? But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. Anytime the Bible, Jesus is talking about servants, he's talking about Christians who entered into a labor agreement. That doesn't mean that he's not going to hold it against you if you are uh, merciless or mean to non-Christians, but in these passages, he's focusing on the household of God, the family of God, the children of God. He's telling you how to act amongst your family members. That's what these lessons are. But that doesn't mean you can be mean and cruel to non-Christians. That's not what it's saying. But he's focusing in on the family, how the family should act. All right, how the children should act amongst other children. When the master of the servant... Oh, but anyways, what I wanted to say again, or also in reference to verse 5, when Jesus, when Father, when they um, observe you being physically cruel, all right, physically cruel to your fellow family members, do you know what Jesus remembers? He remembers being punched, kicked, beard pulled out. Okay. Crown of thorns. Scourged across his back. This is what comes to mind when he sees you being cruel, physically cruel 
physically hurting any other family member. This is what comes to mind. And what does it say? The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware of and he will cut him in two. Does that say he's going to spank three times? He will kill him. On the day that Jesus returns, he will kill hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, between his, um, what his voice being uttered is doing above the men of flesh, below in the earth, the lava being spewed out like the nostrils of God, the earth quaking and shaking, the hailstones the size of concrete cinder blocks, the lightning strikes. When he utters his voice, he's going to be killing hundreds of thousands, probably millions of the wicked. All right? And he's going to use his bride, the blessed servants, as his threshing sledge, and they will kill many people that night. This is the battle of the great day of God Almighty. See my other lessons. The bride is an army, and they fight, and they thresh. And they use a bow of bronze as they ride on their chariots of fire. It's not symbolism, brothers and sisters. It's all over the Bible, and Father means it. You're going to be handed uh, the arrows of deliverance. A whole other lesson. I hope you'll check it out, though. Um, so what, we, what do we have so far? We've got a blessed, faithful, and wise uh, worker. Now we, we've got one. Remember Matthew 13. Now we've got one on a, that uh, he didn't take root in good soil. Okay, This is one of the other three. What, thorny or stony, wayside? After a while, he, he's not good anymore. He's tired of being good. Foreman's never going to show up, or the master, or the head foreman. However you want to uh, uh, refer to Father or his son Jesus. And it was, and it says on the last day he's gonna. If he finds him alive, we're talking about a physical body, but also what's more importantly is your spiritual body, and and this is going, referring to that as well. But he's going to kill him if he's alive, cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. What is the portion of the unbelievers? They can't enter the kingdom of God. Do they have to pay for their sins? Yes, they have to pay for their sins. Their sins are not blotted out. All right, so we've got the blessed servant. We've got the one that begins to beat his family members and eat and drink with the drunkards and not even care about the labor agreement that he entered into. He's going to be killed, and the one who begins to do physical harm to his family members or take them into the synagogues and try them and scourge them, they're going to have their portion with the unbelievers. What's some more names for the unbelievers? Well, that's a tough one. It depends on whether you consider them the called ones that who weren't chosen, or are you talking about the sons of the wicked one, the seed cast by Satan, or a combination of the both? That's a little tough, but the bottom line is they ne the, those who did not enter into a labor agreement, they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now look at verse 47, and that servant, now we're talking about a different one, who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Father is paying a lot of attention which Christians, those who enter into the labor agreement, those Christians, which ones know their mission, they've tuned in enough to the Holy Spirit to know what their mission is, but they don't do it. 
what happens to them? But he who did not, uh, excuse me, verse 47, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do it or do according to his will. So there's the prep. You need to get something out of that verse, brothers and sisters. There needs to be some time spent preparing to do the mission that Father has given you. But then there comes a time to quit preparing and actually do the mission. Now you may say, well, it's hard to know what Father's mission is for me. It is. I think it is. But whatever... This is me talking now. This is me talking. Whatever advances the kingdom of God but yet is enjoyable to you is probably your mission. Does that make sense? If you enjoy doing it, if, you, if you're getting up at 3 or 4 o'clock every morning and, and doing YouTube videos, Bible study lessons, or, or just reading the Word, or whatever it is, it, if it's something that's not your normal personality, it's unlike you. People say there's something different about you. I, that's not like you. What's going on? You, you, yeah, you got up early, but you never enjoyed it. Now you jump out of bed at 3 or 4 in the morning, and the first thing you do is crack open the Bible. Or maybe you make a, a YouTube video, or work on your ministry, or, or whatever. If his burden, his yoke is easy, it's light. If you're actually enjoying doing it, it's probably his mission for you. But we can't say that you're not, uh, there's not brothers and sisters that are going to rough it in very harsh conditions. They are truly blessed. But that was me talking. Again, when you're reading Luke 12, keep Matthew 13 in mind. We've got unbelievers mentioned. We've got the blessed servant. We've got the servant that begins to beat his uh, fellow servants because he gave up waiting on Jesus to return. <clears throat> We've got this servant who knew what his mission was, but never did it. Never even bothered to prepare for it. What happens? He shall be beaten with many stripes. That should get your attention, brothers and sisters. He shall be beaten with many stripes. But he's a servant. Hmm. We're going to go next to Matthew 18, and we're going to look at what Jesus refers to as the torturers. And you need to be thinking about this verse when we go to Matthew 18. I bet that's not taught in church. The torturers. Remember what Revelation says about his portion with the unbelievers. What's the portion of the unbelievers? That's the lake of fire and brimstone at the great white throne judgment. Do you remember reading that? Well, let's turn to that real quick in case you... You're, you're not familiar with what his portion means. Let's see if I can find it in Revelation at the end of the Bible. Well, right here, in verse 8 of, of Revelation 21, it says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, that should make you uh, your bud curdle, shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns or the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death that's the portion of the unbelieving the unbelievers right there revelation 21 8 okay we should probably put a little footnote in our bibles revelation 21 8 the unbelievers verse 46 in fact, I'll do that right now. Revelation 21, 8. Unbelievers. There you go. Verse. All right, now. 
So we've already read 47, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Verse 48, but he who did not know yet committed these things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with a few. For every one to whom much is given, from him much will be required. What is given? Are we talking about things like your daily bread and things like that? I don't think so. I think what he's referring to when it says much is given is knowledge. Right here in verse 47 and 48. Who knew? Who did not know? Much is given. The much is given is referring to the knowledge of God, the plan of Father, the truth, and also the truth in what your mission is. So the more you understand your mission and don't do it, the more you're deserving of stripes. I'll word it like that, deserving of stripes. Does that make sense? So when you're praying to Father and did when you're praying to Father that His Holy Spirit will tell you what your mission is, you better be ready to prepare to do it and to do it. Because be careful what you ask for. Alright? Now I'm not trying to scare you off to the point where you don't ever want to seek His will. No, you're His servant who entered a labor agreement. You need to be asking the foreman. Alright? Maybe not directly to the owner of the company, but you better at least ask the foreman or ask Father Spirit, what's my mission? You, I'm ready to go to work for you. No matter how hard I work, I'm not going to deserve eternal life in your existence and your love. But since you're making this offer, I want to accept it. Well... If you find out your mission and you don't do it and you didn't even prepare for it, be careful. So again, uh, I'm going to read 48 again to end Luke 12. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few for every one to whom much is given from him much will be required and to whom much has been committed of him they will ask the more who's they father and son um, are you going to be judged by the twelve disciples good questions that may have to do with whether you're a seed of Jacob or not, naturally. But, Matthew 18, let's go to the verses that talk about the torture. And being delivered to the torturers. Okay, let's see. But again, you've got these four servants. You, you know, you've got the unbelievers involved here. But try to match this up with Matthew 13 the best you can. It'll help give you better understanding. Now let's go to... Matthew 18. If I don't, if I'm not able to answer all of your questions today, brothers and sisters, and have full understanding, that's all right. You need to know where these passages are. You need to be asking yourselves these same questions. Okay, I don't know at all. I'm learning every day. But don't deny these verses are there. Let's read Matthew 18. 21 through 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? <clears throat> Up to seven times? It's a question. Peter's asking Jesus. Jesus said to Peter, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, did he really mean 70 times seven or was that Jesus' way of saying, do you, how much forgiveness do you want from me? when you come before me to be judged either at your death or when I return to earth at the seventh bowl if you're still alive how much forgiveness do you want from me that's pretty deep right there you know brothers and sisters I'm gonna keep reading this 
passage. But I just spotted verse 20 here in Matthew 18. It is so important. I'm going to read it because I know it's going to be a blessing to somebody. And the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you need to point this out, so I'm going to do so. Matthew 18, verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. That's powerful, brothers and sisters. All it takes is two. Truly gathered together in his name. Asking for his will. Learning Father's plan. Learning the truth. Seeking an assignment. Two or three coming together. Seeking an assignment from Father. Hallelujah. Or maybe he gave you one and you finished it. Now you've rested up a while and now you're asking for a new assignment that you have to prepare for and then you have to act on it. Remember, it's not just a matter of salvation or your portion with the unbelievers. There's also something called rewards that last for hundreds of trillions of years. Hallelujah. Eternity. All right, back to this passage. All right, Jesus, Peter said, How many times do I have to forgive this knucklehead? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. Put your thinking caps on now. You want to know the truth? Father's plan? That's Anytime he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, this is Father's plan. This is the truth. This is what Father's goal is. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. Okay, that's Father who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. You know, Matthew 22 talks about that same certain king. That's Father. Why isn't it capitalized? Because it's a parable. Who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When does Father settle accounts with his servants? This is almost like in two stages, but i got to be careful here, because primarily what he's talking about is the great white throne judgment, but this is settling accounts with his servants. There's going to be a settling of accounts when Jesus comes to set up the kingdom of heaven, also called the kingdom of God. All right? Here on earth at the seventh bowl, settle accounts. That's one of the things Jesus is going to do with his servants, those who entered into a labor agreement. Now, that means rewards, but it also could mean what we just read in Luke 12, the things that are deserving of stripes. You know, were the things deserving of stripes only for the unbelievers? Or, or was it for three out of four Christians that we find in Matthew 13 the great falling away that's going to happen during the time the Antichrist is working miracles is that involved in this this thought process here this warning things deserving of stripes you will be delivered to the torturers well brother you haven't read anything about torturers yet we're getting ready to hang on settling accounts Verse 24, and when he had begun to settle accounts, in other words, he just arrived at the seventh bowl, one was brought to him uh, who owed him 10,000 talents. But as, remember, we're talking about a parable of a certain king, but we know what's, what's mentioned here. But as he was not able to pay his master, but as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and all that he had and that payment be made. Wow. That servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all I, eventually. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Forgave him, brothers and sisters, not... Well, I'm going to give you another month to make payment. Forgave. Hallelujah. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, family members, Christians, who owed him a hundred denarii. 
And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. Now we know what's meant in Luke 12, putting your hands on your fellow servants, beating them, breaking their knees, right? You are going to pay me what you owe. You're going to do what I say, physically abusing them. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that they had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me when you prayed to me, and I gave you my spirit and gave you my son, and you were written in the book of life. I forgave you. But because I delayed my coming, you wouldn't forgive your fellow brethren, and you begin to beat them, saying they owe you and they will do what you say? Should you not, verse 33, should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servants just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. That's what we read in Luke chapter 12. Deserving of stripes. You will be delivered to the torturers and you shall pay. What does this mean? Be the blessed servant that gets glorified. Don't be the servants that don't get glorified at Jesus' return. Aren't all Christians being glorified at Jesus' return? No, brothers and sisters. That's what Matthew 13 told you. That's what Luke 12 just told you. Now you're learning it again in Matthew 18. Not all servants who enter into the labor agreement will be glorified and be considered a blessed servant. You've got some who are going to be uh, given their portion with the unbelievers. You've got some who are going to have to uh, pay based on uh, deserving of stripes. They're going to be delivered to the torturers until they pay all that was due him. Verse 35, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Brothers and sisters, is that not the Lord's prayer? Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness of trespasses. Brothers and sisters, if you got it, nothing else from this lesson, I pray that you got that. Forgive your brother his trespasses as, as, uh, and ask Father to forgive you of your trespasses because you do forgive your brother his trespasses. This, this lesson may have opened your eyes about Matthew 13. I pray that it has. Uh, you need to know about these torturers. You want to be a member of the blessed and be glorified. Be careful, especially if you have knowledge of Jesus and the truth. You better be extra careful and do what you're told. Brothers and sisters, I hope this lesson has been a blessing to you, and I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.